So, there we go. We are broadcasting on both streams. Hello and welcome. Welcome. Is there a particular psychology which makes people prone to accept the arbitrary rule and subordination of government if you are of the opinion that government rule is arbitrary and subordinate? Is there indeed more than one? That is what we're going to explore today. Welcome to episode 91 of the Scottish Libertarian, sorry, Scottish Liberty Podcast, I even know the name of my own day and podcast. Are we are coming through loud and clear on YouTube? Because I need to know that people aren't going, um, where is your sound? So that's going to be the topic of today's discussion. You may wonder why Tam isn't here, if you're a regular listener to the show. He's got a migraine. So he's forced me to confront an issue that I've wanted to do on the show for ages and ages and ages. Thank you for tuning me, tuning in. But I've not had the balls to put my thoughts together. So there's going to be a lot of putting my thoughts together on the live stream. But luckily, I've got notes. So uh, I'll talk around the notes. So, But before we get into it, um, I've got a couple of announcements. The first one is that next week we'll be interviewing the legendary Norman Finkelstein. He's an expert on the Arab-Israeli conflict. He's very critical of Israel, but he's also been critical of the, um, the pa Palestinian boycott, divest, and sanctions movement. Uh, as you know, my co-host and I are split on the Israel issue. So you definitely want to check out next week's. And if you've got any questions for Norman Finkelstein, please go on to YouTube and leave it as a comment. Um, secondly, more importantly, next week we're having a very special Scottish Liberty podcast event. We're going to hang out with our friends, our, our fans. We've scheduled it for around 11.30 p.m., uh, UK time so that as many of our American listeners as possible can come. Now, here's the thing. We're going to shave my head. My glorious locks are going to the dogs. My glorious locks. So that's the point. Now, here's the interesting thing. We've got loads and loads of special guests coming. Um, to join us on the live stream, uh, James Fox Higgins from The Rational Rise, um, Elizabeth Hobson, um, uh, we've got uh, people coming from pretty much every freaking libertarian, independent libertarian podcast you think, da Daniel Elwood and Robert Johnson of a Actual Anarchy, Kyle Am a Anzalone of Foreign Policy Focus, Scott D. Luffy of the ANCAP Barbershop, Jeremy Hengler of Seeds of Liberty Podcast, Patrick McFarlane of Liberty Weekly, Stephen Clyde of the Peace and Liberty Podcast, Darren Dioji of the Alternative Answers YouTube channel, the lovely Sherry Voluntary of the Sherry Re Voluntary Podcast. Loads of people have agreed to come on the live stream with us and talk to us. Uh, before I shave my hair. So please come to that event. Not only that, um, I need your help to promote it on Facebook because it's got l rules that I'm only allowed to invite 100 people or something like that. So go to the event in the description of the YouTube video and uh, go to the event and on Facebook and invite other libertarians that you know listen to the show because I can't invite everyone on Facebook. So please do me a favor. Okay, that's next week. Right, that's it for the admin. Back to the psychology of statism. This is going to be very, very interesting. I believe it's going to be very interesting. So, okay, I've said before, and I said this on a show called Choice Conversations, you can check out an episode of Be Yourself and Love It podcast. Uh, it's episode two. It's called, it's something on uh, effective communication, um, on uh, authentic relationships. And I, he asked me what I thought the link between libertarianism and uh, politics was, and, or, or, and uh, my interest in personal development was, and obviously there's the individualist aspect, which is that you have 
uh, personal development is about sorting yourself out and libertarianism is about you being responsible to yourself but also I thought you know I got into politics when I was on the left and I wanted to change the world through politics but I didn't see much benefit in front of my eyes to all that uh, going in a room at parties and trying to change someone's mind so afterwards I got bored of it and uh, the great thing is if you've ever done any volunteering or you you or for example I'm a counsellor as many of you know a therapist and you get to use your attention to help people and you see the benefits of what you're doing right in front of your eyes so you know you need to if you want to change the world through politics you basically need to convince enough people to uh, vote to make some change and you delegate it to some a uh, third party and hope that they're going to wield the power of the state for good. Now I've got a presentation called Why Markets Work, Public Versus Private, where I go through the reasons why I think they're very unlikely to do that. So you can follow that up as well, I mean, because uh, uh, I don't want to go into all the arguments again. So the thing is, you want to see the power in front uh, of your own actions in front of you. You want to see that you make a difference. And I dare say that maybe our friends on the right are a little bit more um, savvy to this than our friends on the left um, because they just get their head down. Uh, I'm talking in general terms, of course, right? They're more, they just get their head down to work and they go, why all this navel gazing and uh, going out in the streets and trying to rabble rouse? Why don't you just... Do your job, take care of your family, and uh, donate money to charity. Stop with all this rabble rousing, okay? That's a sort of um, stereotype of a conservative view. And the thing is, so one of the things I said was politics is interpersonal politics on that um, podcast on communication skills, which you can find on Be Yourself and Love It podcast, Authentic Relationships is the name of the podcast. And I said, well, politics is interpersonal politics. A lot of what the state does would look stupid to a population that was very competent, was happy, had good relationships, right? See if you've got excellent communication skills and you're great at resolving conflicts. War would look stupid to you because you'd be like, this is like, you know, what are we doing? You should sit down, down around the table and resolve your conflicts wherever possible. And then... Um, so it would be stupid to lock people up for things like smoking weed or uh, taking drugs because what you want to do is you, you acknowledge that they, maybe they have a problem and they need a connection and commun yeah, good communication in their life so that they don't need to compensate for a lack of connection by taking drugs, which is borne out uh, by the literature on addiction. And it's why they, when they put people in rehab, they also build connection as well as... Um, as well as just uh, trying to deal with their symptoms. And so a lot of what the state looks stupid would look stupid um, if we sorted our own houses out, if we looked after ourselves. And I was thinking about these stereotypes of lefties as kind of weedy guys with poor social skills who uh, go to university and spend all their time in the library and a lot of them can't hold girls down. So uh, certainly a lot of the, um, the left wing intellectuals are very, um, a lot of the great intellectuals are left-wingers, not, not right-wingers, they're more thinky people, and let more thinky, less practical. And righties, the stereotype is being chance that, you know, there aren't huge numbers of right-wing intellectuals, and, and uh, that has always given the left license to sort of say, well, we've got the intellectual higher ground. Those conservatives are just stuffy. They don't think much and they're not very intelligent and they don't uh, apply to reason and evidence. But you know, you need elaborate theories to justify the use of force. Oh, there's the social con oh, contract. Oh, um, it's not re taxation isn't really theft, blah, 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 blah. You, you need elaborate theories to actually justify um, the force of the state. You don't really need elaborate theories to say things like you just do what you just do what you have a social duty. You do what uh, your country demands of you. You be a good citizen, right? That doesn't require an elaborate theory. It's left wing theories that require a lot of thinking. So, and here's the thing: conservatives did take up the challenge of defending capitalism or free markets with reason, and that's why they're losing. That's why they lost, right? They defended it by. Um, appeal to tradition. 
uh, oh, it's always been like that. Oh, well, these things have stood the test of time, right? Um, and and this, they, they needed, conservatives needed non-conservatives like Anne Rand and Murray Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises to lay down the groundwork for defending capitalism. And how did conservatives thank them for it, right? How did conservatives thank Ayn Rand? Well, they cannibalized these people for any faults they could find. Oh, Murray Rothbard's an anarchist. Oh, Ayn Rand, she's not patriotic. Uh, she, oh, Ayn Rand, well, no one would say she wasn't patriotic. She loved America. But they say, oh, she's not religious. She's an atheist. She's a bad person. She promotes self-interest. We're not like that. We're good. We love altruism, blah, blah, blah. You know, the conservatives cannibalized the people who laid down the philosophical foundation for defending their positions, right? Uh, do you hear conservatives talk about Ludwig von Mises? I certainly haven't. The greatest economist, uh, certainly one of the great men of the 20th century, okay? And because they failed to justify their ideas with re reason and evidence, they just tradition, religion, and as Ayn Rand pointed out, uh, depravity, the appeal, oh, human beings, they're just, human beings are just depraved. We need a strong government to make sure it's not anarchy and craziness. Uh, you know, uh, that's the conservative idea of defending their ideology. In fact, conservatism has to die and be replaced with libertarianism if we've got any hope for Western civilization at all. Uh, conservatism is anti-intellectualism to a large degree, not in all cases, but often. So, um, so it wasn't until you know the last few years when people like Stefan Molyneux and Tom Woods and all the libertarian intellectuals uh, busted onto the scene that we got a uh, huge, huge uh, traction in terms of bringing reason and evidence to. Uh, the left and now and the left weren't prepared for this. They weren't prepared for a bunch of uh, very intelligent people, full of reason and evidence, uh, to argue them on capitalism versus socialism, which is why they're going hysterical and no platforming speakers because they can't deal with arguments. They're so used to being in uh, universities arguing which type of socialism is the best instead of arguing socialism versus capitalism. Well, we're only 15 minutes in and I, I, I'm fucking really enjoying myself. I hope you guys are liking it too. If you do, smash the share button, smash some likes so that I know that, so I know that you're enjoying it too. So I'm definitely giving it to both the left and the right in this one. I'm not holding, pulling back any punches. So I see a kind of split in personality between the left winger and the right winger, the left wing intellectual uh, who's not got the best social skills in the world and uh, lives up in his head and the kind of right-wing chad, so to speak, who's more practical, more likely to put up a, a book of shelves. And I saw this split before I, I got into Jordan Peterson or Jonathan Haidt and, um, uh, and they, I'll just say a bit on each of them. Jo uh, jo uh, Jonathan Haidt wrote a great book called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Disagree on uh, Politics and Religion. And the great thing about that is he talks about there's like different flavors of morality, like your tongue has different flavors. And he says that different flavors of morality appeal to the left and right. The right are, the, they're both concerned with fairness, but to the right that means keeping what you earn, to the left that means equality. So, um, uh, sanctity is important to conservatives. They they like uh, the sacred tradition, whereas uh, uh, left wingers are more like rip it up and start again. You know, forget about tradition. The right wing, uh, they they like what one species of morality is duty. The left don't like duty as a morality because it's not based on rationality. It's not. Uh, where does this idea that I submit to authority come from? You should check out his work. I can't go through everyone's works. I'm going to refer to tons of people. The righteous mind if you want to hear more about that jordan peterson talked about a personality split between the left and right which is the left tend to be low on conscientiousness and high on openness they're more open to new ideas even whereas the right are lower on openness they like what they know and they're highest higher on conscientiousness so that's interesting how the left 
hate the free market and they're not conscientious but they are open i just want to create like why should i have to uh, go to a job and obey a boss you know why should i have to do that i just want you know they're openness and more creative um but they're not conscientious they they, they don't have a tendency to be hard working now i uh, suffered through lower conscientiousness and I wrote a book on becoming more conscientious called Procrastination Annihilation which you can get for free from beyourselfandloveit.com forward slash do it uh, and I feel like if you could if they got more training in school on how to be conscientious they wouldn't be such rabid statists they don't really help you with that I think a lot of people by the time they come out the other end of school are so used to being bossed around that they can't boss themselves around anymore. They don't have a intrinsic motivation. They're so used to being extrinsically motivated by carrots and sticks, they can't find the motivation inside themselves uh, to achieve their goals. And that is a very sad indictment of school that it doesn't train people to be conscientious. Most people come out unconscientious. So we have this split in their personality. And I was thinking about the psychology of the organism, what many of you know, that I'm a psychologist myself, I'm a therapist, uh, and I was thinking about traumatology, and you, we've all heard of the fight or flight response, right? So I'm gonna teach you a little bit about trauma and neuroscience, I'm gonna try and be brief here. When you experience a trauma, your brain reacts, but it doesn't unreact, and they can demonstrate this by giving a rat a minor stroke, and uh, within a day, it's regrown the blood vessel that it used to carry blood to that part of its brain, but maybe it can't see or it can't move its front um, claws because it's lost functionality because the brain reacted to the trauma, but it didn't unreact. Now, there's nothing wrong with its eyes or its claws. It's just the brain thinks, well, that's how I survived that situation. Therefore, that's a good pattern for me. I'm going to keep that. And if you want to reverse the effects of trauma, you need to do conscious work. It might be um, uh, trauma therapy, trauma release exercises, bioenergetics, EMDR, somatic experiencing. There's all these modalities that can help reverse this, uh, the trauma, but it's, but, but it's not going to do itself. Basically, the brain doesn't care about your quality of life. As far as the brain is concerned, it wants you to survive. So if it needs to sacrifice functionality to preserve the organism, it will do that. That's what evolution has uh, set it up to do. So I am you could say I'm a utopian idealist in the fact that I look around the world and I don't think this, I'm not like a conservative who thinks humans are just so badly inherently flawed. I think they are inherently flawed, but I think a lot of what we see in the world can be explained by understanding trauma and how trauma affects the brain. Now, when do you experience a trauma? It's in a situation of fight or flight where you can neither fight or flee. When you have a real or perceived threat to your life, the threat doesn't need to be real. A kid that's left on his own at the bus stop while it's raining for two hours could experience a trauma. Another one might just be on their iPod and not care, right? One might experience a trauma if they perceive a threat to their life. They go into a sort of fight or flight mode. They don't know how to handle the situation. Someone in a small car accident can uh, experience a trauma, whereas someone in a serious accident might not. They might not have time for the brain to react, right? So this is like uh, Stefan Molyneux. In the same way as Marxists believe in the new socialist man, that we can socially engineer a better man, Stefan Molyneux believes through peaceful parenting, we can engineer the new libertarian man, okay? And I'm sympathetic, I'm sympathetic to his position. I don't think it's maybe the all, but I definitely lean towards, we've not really seen human nature. We've not seen what humans are capable of because we lack the understanding of psychology. We lack the um, ability right now to put everyone through um, what is required to reverse all their traumas so we see the, the, the greater capacities that human beings have. Now, how would that happen on the free market? Someone would say, well, Anthony, you're a libertarian. How are we going to help people uh, fully flourish without um, the government to make them fully flourish? Well, the thing is, our system, our welfare system, and 
all the things that the government does, including 11 to 13 years of mandatory education where you're bossed around and not taught any useful skills, they contribute, if anything, to the damage. But more than that, they disincentivize people becoming fully functioning. On a free market, the better your function is, the more resources you can gather, the better a life you can have. Right now, the government disincentivizes you. The better they do, the more they hobble you. What's more, they will pay you to be poor using a welfare state. If you've got bad mental health, uh, the, the, the state services for mental health are absolutely horrendous. I've had people come to me as clients who've gone through the official channel, maybe they've been domestically abused, and a psychiatrist or a, a phoned their abuser and asked if their story was true. That's a fucking real thing that happened. I've had people patronized by psychologists and therapists because there's no market mechanism there. When someone pays for my services, I have to do a bloody good job because if I don't do a good job, they fire me. The client is the authority. When you go through the mental health services, the official channels, they're the authority. They're going to tell you what's wrong with you, what pills you have to take, right? You're not a consumer. Now, because the welfare state pays people not to get over their psychological blocks, there is a lack of demand for mental health services compared to what there would be in a free market. On a free market, people who were hobbled in some way by their childhood would want to um, unlock their capacities so they could go as high as they go. And because so many people were in the same position, I hope you like my rolled up sleeves, uh, because so many people in the position uh, of trying to unhobble themselves, the market demand for excellent practitioners who excelled at helping people overcome their blocks would blossom. Uh, there'd be a greater level of expertise and more experts and Finally, best practices would emerge and we would learn through the process of market discovery of competition of competing services, what is the best way to unlock the human potential. Even people with their comparatively low capacities would be able to find meaningful work and, uh, if, and also everything would be so cheap because there would be a free market. So the, the amount of uh, competition would push down the price of goods and services. So you might not need to work that much. Okay, so back to the psychology of statism. We have this split. You've got the fight or flight freeze response. People are traumatized. And I was just thinking, like, I'm wondering if that here's the critical thesis. The left wingers are the more flight people. Oh, why can't we get along? Like, I would rather, like, let's look at the way that they view Islam for example, versus the way the right view Islam. Oh, we need to get in there and give them a broken nose and teach them a lesson before they come over here. We need to go over there and kill them before they come over here and kill us. Fight, flight. The left do not acknowledge that there is a threat from outsiders who have ideologies that are disparate to our own. Can we all get along? Everyone's just like us. We want to be nice to each other, right? Can we just give people free stuff you know, why, why do we need to subject people? They would rather hurt them. They, were, they would rather they were hurt by someone else than hurt someone else. Have you heard of pathological altruism? That is the idea of helping someone to their detriment. I can't stand the idea of someone else suffering. So I need, even though sometimes suffering is necessary, you learn from suffering not to do the things that you did that made you suffer. Unless, of course, it's no fault of your own then, of course, uh, there's a place to help people. But if you keep on protecting people from the consequences of their action. So I think that left-wingers are the more flight, um, the more susceptible to flight uh, res trauma response, and the right-wingers are more res susceptible to fight trauma response. And it's an interesting thing, the way that trauma works, because it makes grooves in your neural science. So... Um, if you had a trauma where the only way you thought you would survive was getting belligerent, then that begins to set a pattern. And if that happens again and again, if you have a violent childhood or whatever, then you start to learn to respond to that by becoming aggressive. Okay, that's your physiology. If you, and I'm not saying that it's, that it's necessarily all nurture. Some of it might be genetic, what your predisposition is. That we don't know yet. We don't have enough information. Whereas 
if you learn from your childhood that the best way to get along is just to always put other people before you, become a people pleaser, then your tra- and when you experience traumas, that may be your experience of, uh, of, uh, of responding to your environment and suffering, uh, and, and sorry, surviving, and that will put those degrees, degrees through your head. And I'm sorry that I'm not responding to comments on YouTube. There's a lot of you trying to um, come in and talk. I really appreciate them. I'll see if I can get to them all at the end because I'm just going to roll and I don't want to break up my uh, line of thinking. So if you look at Lloyd de Moss's work, The Origins of uh, War and Child Abuse and The Emotional Life of Nations, these two books, uh, these two books go through history and talk about the prevalent styles of parenting in these in societies and then the governments that seem to come to power after those styles of parenting. If you look somewhere like, say, India, where they had an extended families, they have a pantheon of gods. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and the old day, the Old Testament God is a punishing God. If you don't do what Daddy says, He is uh, He is going to punish you. Whereas Jesus puts a more benign face on a parental figure, which I sacrificed so much for you. I'm so kind, but I sacrificed everything for you on the cross. Interesting. That sounds like a parenting style to me. And He points out that the idea that your parents would actually say to you something like. Um, what do you want to do when you grow up? That is a 20th century phenomenon. Before that, you did what your parents did. You married who your parents said. All your labor belonged to your funeral lord. Well, that's going um, 18th century backwards. You know, your labor used to, you didn't have the leisure time. You didn't have choice. You did what society said. It was very conservative, so to speak. Right. So, Check it out. And I know some of you are skeptical about peaceful parenting and you think that kids need a good smack. Well, I'll tell you something. Smacking a child is the kind of situation in which they are going, they are likely to experience a trauma. And I'll tell you why. Because you're putting them in a situation where they are likely to experience uh, wanting to to go into a fight or flight response, to fight or fly. And if you're holding down, them down and smacking them, then they can't fight or they can't fly, okay? They can't run away from you and they can't hit you back, okay? So that's a very, very likely situation in which you're gonna cause a child trauma. So for those of you libertarians who are still holding on to the idea that you should still smack children, you should do your bloody well research, okay? This is serious stuff. You're talking about um, someone whose brain is still forming. So I want to. I'm going to do a little. Um, I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm going to do a little. First of all, I, I recommend a book called Beyond Discipline by Alfie Cohen. Someone will have to go through this video and list all the like all the the podcasts and the videos and the people that I suggest, and I'll, I'll put links to each of them in the description if someone does that for me. Uh, Alfie Cohen, Beyond Discipline, uh, he talks about punishment and, and how punishment is basically um, just uh, scaring people into comply. And the thing is, you, the, it only works because it, it creates immediate compliance, but it has a whole bunch of other side effects. You're basically making people selfish. You're saying, if you don't do what I say, I will do something bad to you. So they have to think about the consequences to themselves. You're not teaching them to think about the consequences to other people of their behavior. Peaceful parenting works. I mean, when I was a classroom assistant, I had a great day where um, we, uh, the, the teacher took the kids out to learn about lines of symmetry and she put them in pairs and uh, they, um, they sat down and they were meant to, one was meant to draw half a shape and the other was meant to complete the shape, and then they were to draw the lines of symmetry through the shape. And uh, some of them just wrote down their name. So she came over and bawled to them, and, oh, is your name symmetrical, blah, blah, blah. And in that moment, I just had an intuition. And I went over there, and I just said, okay, which letters in your name are symmetrical? The guy pointed to the capital A, to the O, and said, okay, draw the lines of symmetry. 
And the teacher saw that. She just didn't have the creativity. She didn't read books like me, like uh, um, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen or Parent Effectiveness Training or Summerhill, great books on how to raise children better uh, without using force and coercion, the minimum amount possible. She saw that. She, you can't unsee something like that. I taught her how to deal with an adverse situation. Instead of making the kids bad for not doing what they were told, I tried to find a way to use what they did do to teach them the lesson they were meant to learn. That takes ingenuity, that takes brains, right? It's not a surprise that more conservative, people from more conservative backgrounds tend to come from more strict parenting and upbringing. Maybe, maybe the lefties, maybe their parents are too loosey-goosey. They're like, we had to work hard for this money and now we just want to give it and we just want to make sure that you had the um, advantages that we didn't have you know so so they they, they give uh, give they do too much for their kids maybe because um peaceful parenting isn't license i didn't just say well you kids just do whatever you want you know whatever i still taught them the lesson by engage with them constructively so I mean, I had kids go off the rails, but the thing is, if I could have just smack that kid, I never would have learned what I needed to learn in order to engage with them constructively. And all the kids in the classroom respected me. And, um, you know, I had an incident where one kid said, Anthony, is your name Anthony? And I was like, yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm going to call you Anthony. And I said, well, I'll call you Mr. Whatever his surname was. And he was like, no, I'll call you Mr. Samaroff and you call me and said his name. He wanted to, he wanted to respect me because I earned the respect. I didn't expect respect from kids. I always made it my job to be helpful, to be wise, to be interesting, to be a good resource, not to shout. And um, if they were doing something I didn't want, to, didn't want them to do, I tried to be non-judgmental and try to discover why they were doing what they were doing so that I could engage with them constructively. You have to have brains to raise kids well. So, I don't want to go into the, uh, maybe talk a little bit about punishment in the justice system when I talk about conservatism more in the future, um, but I don't, I don't want to get sidetracked. Okay, so let's talk about some right-wing psychology uh, and left-wing psychology. I mean, that is the, the topic of today's discussion. The mindless right-wing love of authority, worship of hierarchy, you must, it's your duty, do as you're told, without giving any reason for why it's your duty. You're just meant to do it, right? To even ask, why should I have to do it just because you're older than me or, or because whatever, because the boss said so or because it's the law, right? Even asking that is seen as insubordination, right? Love of the, in previous times, when liberalism emerges in our, uh, um, as an ideology, love of the monarch, uh, the nation state. What's this nation state? It's just a bunch of bloody lines in a map. Yeah, you can have cultural things in common with people. Where are these nation states? They're in your freaking head, right? They don't exist. That doesn't mean that there, that there aren't cultural boundaries, there aren't uh, you know, various uh, ideologies that, don't, that aren't compatible. Of course there are. But the line is essentially arbitrary, right? It's just where someone, some king conquered and some other king conquered, right? So this fealty to the tribe, it's right-wing collectivism. You're not a good person because you earned it. You're a good person. You're part of my team, right? And of course, the flag. You're not allowed to burn the flag. You have to worship the flag, okay? Now, I'm not saying there isn't anything wrong with tradition. We're going to come to that as well. But where are these... Nation states, they're in your fucking head, right? If I took you to the border between one country and another, you wouldn't know where India starts and Pakistan ends. So how can you be a patriotic Indian or patriotic Pakistani? So to the left, this seems completely mindless and irrational. And there is a rationality to it, though. There's a pre-rationality to it, because obviously where we came from in tribal societies, you had to be loyal to your tribe, because if you didn't, well... Someone was gonna kill you. You need, you need. So it, it, it may not be rational. It's pre-rational. It does have an important place. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to deny its importance. We wouldn't have. Maybe, perhaps, we've not been able to evolve to this without that right-wing collectivism. 
Okay, so I might have been critical of it, but that maybe that's because I'm a former lefty. You know, the left are like, chuck it out and start again. So the left are, are irrational in their own way. Can't we all just get along? Uh, we shouldn't judge people by the, uh, you know, and, and like, well, I mean, I, I agree we should judge people by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin, of course. But they deny the differences between people and that there are people that may have ideologies that aren't compatible with their way of life. The idea, the vague idea that you bring millions of people over from a different culture and that's not going to change your culture oh no we're all exactly the same if you take them and you put them here they'll become just like us even if they are 22 years old and grew up in a tribal culture or 35 or 45 even if they don't know the language even if they don't have the skills to integrate into the economy right and or, and, or say like get get a girl which is serious do you know what i mean for for our biology right so there's a there's an idealism there as well and um, we should all be free and independent to do our own thing we should all be equal well should what the hell does should mean first of all i know i know it's a bit of a straw man when i'm not actually debating with someone but they do say we should all be equal and second of all what is this equal like no, no one is equal to anyone else right i'm not equal to a guy that's not bald uh, i do not have the advantage of being tall, okay? So I need to develop my uh, seduction skills because I believe women prefer taller men. But that's why I've got such a great sense of humor and I'm so intelligent and witty, right? So am I right? Am I right? The biological drives are strong with this one. So, you know, uh, women aren't equal to men. That doesn't mean that they mean less, that, that, that doesn't mean that they are of less value. It means that they have different character traits, uh, you know, uh, and I, I'm no one's equal to anyone else. There's a lot more practical and conscientious people than I am that are less intelligent than me. Now, if you mean a quality of opportunity, there's no such thing either. Does a paedophile have a quality of opportunity to work in a school as a person who's not done that? No, and why should they? Okay, so it's an impossible goal. And no matter how far we get along, they keep on pushing the goalpost, pushing the goalpost. It needs to be more equal forever. But uh, I digress, right? Why would you want, uh, they, they do have a good point. Like, why do you want to worship a boss who's not earned that authority? So uh, there's no such thing as equality of opportunity or equality of outcome. And the best you can hope for is freedom of opportunity. And that on a free market, if you're at low skills, there's always going to be someone who wants to profit from you being low skilled. And if there's no minimum wage and not too many labor laws, they can employ you for what you're worth and you can they can train you on the job and you can learn those skills, move to another job and keep on doing the same thing until you're more skilled. It doesn't matter if you have got low capacity now. The point is there's as many opportunities as possible in a free market and you take the ones that best suit you and over a course of time you're being paid to better yourself because of the minimum wage and all the labor laws everywhere says uh, experience wanted everywhere says experience wanted so they're making it hard for people in the bottom to get a leg up okay so back to the psychology to the, to the right the left's flagrant disregard for tradition and disrespect for authority is disgusting that is their emotional response to a lack of respect for authority. How dare they? Who do they think they are? Hmm, sounds very much like an authoritarian parent. I wonder why that might be. Hmm, I wonder if it could do, be to do with the way that they're parented. I wonder if that's why so many conservatives love the military and want to go into the military, where they're subjected to harsh discipline and told what to do all the time. I wonder if it could be something to do with the way they're parented. Hmm, I wonder. I wonder if there can be a correlation between authoritarian parenting and wanting to go into the military. Hmm. I wonder. Oh no, it's just genetic. Oh no, people are just like that. They just pop out the wound like that, and it's all it's all nature. There's no nurture to it. Hmm. I wonder about that. Yes, that sounds very credible to me. Okay. But what do they think of the left, right? They're just a mad bunch of mad hippies. They're too free. They lack discipline and structure, which, by the way, they do. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the right on this. The left totally lack discipline and structure. Left to them, society would go to pot. 
anything would be allowed. If we allow gay marriage, then soon people will be getting married to animals, things that conservatives used to say. Why are they dyeing their hair funny colours? Can't they just get a normal haircut and dress nicely and get a goddamn job? Well, one of us is getting a haircut next week. Don't forget to attend our live event where my hair is getting cut. Link in the description on YouTube, okay? So they should, why can't they cut their, get a normal haircut, dress nicely like me in this shirt and get a normal job? They should be good citizens. And to the left, the idea of being a good citizen is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, why should I? What has society ever done to me? Uh, exact, for me, exactly. All society is trying to do is put me in a box, man. Like, why should I have to submit to that authority? Like, man, come on. Like, come on, man. And this is where kind of classic liberals were more aligned with the left at one point uh, than the right was. Uh, the, uh, the right one, because 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 the liberals, the the early libertarians, they weren't traditionalists, they weren't conservatives. They wanted to rip it up and start again. They wanted to get rid of the monarchy. They wanted to test all ideas against reason. It was an enlightenment philosophy. So um, so um, uh, I'm going to come back to uh, 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 an aside. Hayek came along. Uh, uh, and said that our ethics come from tradition. And he wrote us he wrote a, a essay called I'm not a conservative, but he had a very conservative view of where values come from. He thought that they evolve in a Darwinian way and societies with good values tend to prevail over time. So he had a conservative views of where of where principles and values come from. And uh, this kind of disgusted and ran well she liked Hayek, but she also didn't like him. She thought she was philosophically unsound because he wasn't um, appealing to reason uh, to justify capitalism. He was also making a conservative argument, but he was just making a more intelligent form of an instinctive. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I'm inclined to go with both of them, right? Now, just to come back, of course, as libertarians, we're not against authority or hierarchy. But we believe that it has to be earned, right? You get your authority and hierarchy based on proving your value to your consumer. So we're very different from both the left and right. We're, we've got a hybrid position. In fact, it's not a hybrid position, it's a rational position, right? So we've got we're across we've got skepticism to authority, but unearned authority. Where does the state get its authority from? Come from? How are they allowed to tax you? How are they allowed to put you in a cage for smoking marijuana? Why are they allowed to do that? Where do they get that authority? So we we jibe with the left in a way, but we also jibe with the right because we've got that appreciation for getting your head down and performing doing some hard work. To the right wing, that's duty. To us, you get what you earn. You don't get a right to my friendship. You know, uh, this is what I hear about right wing collectivism, the idea that I should sooner be, be associated with people just because they've got the same color of skin as me is ridiculous. You have to earn that shit. And the same goes, the, we, we think the same about the left. No, sorry, you don't get to steal other people's stuff just because you're too lazy. Right? So, so, of course, if you don't want to get your head down, you've got the right not to do that. We believe you've got the right to do that. We don't think it's your duty the same way as the right to do. It just means that you don't get the same amount of resources as people who do work hard. You pay your money, you take your choice. If you want to live in a tiny flat and only work 16 hours a week, that's fine. You've got the right to do that. So, we believe in counterbalances. That's the thing. You get your, you get your due. You know, there's an old uh, saying. I can't remember what country it comes from, but it says God said, "Take what you want and pay for it." If you want more financial freedom, earn it. If you want more friends, earn it. If you want a higher position in the workplace, earn it. Don't expect people who work hard to be forced at gunpoint to give it to you. And of course, there's also a place for tradition in libertarianism as well. We're not completely against tradition, we're more like the left uh, who thinks that it should be justified, but we've got a great way of testing traditions. It's called the free market. 
Yes, the free market is a great way of testing whether traditions have value still or whether they're outdated. Uh, but because because traditions might be helpful because they stood the test of time, but they can also be tyrannical. And the idea is on the free market, both the extremes of throwing out tradition completely, ripping, and the other extreme of ripping up and uh, sorry, ripping it up and start again. And the other extreme of like a religious fidelity to tradition, tradition no matter what, are challenged, which is why both the left and the right hate the free market. I mean, I know the right say that they are for capitalism, but they've, they've not got a coherent philosophy of why. They've always opposed free trade and for nationalistic reasons. And they aren't exactly vocal about ending corporate welfare or corporate personhood. You don't hear conservatives saying corporations should not be have the same rights as people. But they should be, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you never hear them say that. So our great solution to, to uh, fixing this dilemma is the left need to submit to market discipline. They need to learn to integrate into society at least enough to earn a living, right? So you can do whatever you want outside work. It's up to you in a libertarian society. As long as you don't aggress against otherwise peaceful people, you can be as outrageous as you want. But if you have kids outside of marriage, you can't force someone else to pay for your kids. You can't force someone else to pay for your irresponsible decisions. Whatever freaky weird shit you want to do, you do outside the workplace. Unless you get in a workplace where you're allowed to do that stuff. If you're unconscientious, you don't get paid as much. Sorry, if you don't work hard for it, you don't get it, lefties. Okay, so we moderate the extreme openness of the left. Uh, even if you, you just work for the man as much or as little as you want to. We also, um, the right also have to submit to the discipline of the market. If a, pro, if a better product or service comes along, sorry, that's your tradition, off with it. You know, if people want the new thing more, they're gonna part with money for it. You can't just force people to do what they've always done because it's familiar to you and you like it better. Well, other people aren't here to do what you like better. Right? They're not here they're to do what they like better. It's their life, right? They have to accept that just because they think it's unreligious for people to be op uh, open their shops on Sunday, well, that doesn't mean that everyone has to comply with you and not open their shop on Sunday just because it's your Sabbath. It might not be their Sabbath. Tough, right? You have to accept under libertarianism that you don't have the right to stop people from going to all night clubs or drinking or gambling or eat or taking drugs or even seeing a prostitute. You know, you don't have the right to do that. The market holds nothing sacred, right? Whatever people want to buy, whatever they think they're be will benefit them is what's going to be sold. Which is, by the way, actually does an aside say why you hear the alt right talking about how paternalism is good. Yes. They've, I've heard all writers say that and that we should ban pornography and, and things like that. They are only too willing to oppose their authoritarianist utopia upon everyone else. They've got their own authoritarian utopia that they want to impose. And in my view, many of, well, they're as bad as, they're, as, they're, they're definitely as collectivist as the left, if not more, in some ways. And, and they're just as bad. I don't see the alt-right as fellow travelers particularly. Um, they pretended to be f uh, fellow travellers when they emerged on the scene by talking about social justice warriors and the importance of free speech, but that was just to recruit libertarians. As their movement has evolved, you can see more on YouTube, they become more and more authoritarian. They're obsessed with identity politics, more obsessed with identity politics than the left are. Um, and recently, Richard Spencer said in a live stream that they're not even in favour of free speech. He's like, of course we're not in favour of free speech. We're just being pragmatic. We need these platforms to spread our ideas. So, conservatives are risk averse. They don't want to set the car. They're, they're into security. They're the fight mentality. Let's, we need the government to keep us secure, to keep us safe from terrorists and immigrants. Um, and for invaders, they they just kind of bumble. They they just bumble along with little changes. The left are too open. Like fuck it. Like let's just see what happens. We can run social experiments. Try the policy out. We won't know if it works or not. We can experiment on people. Let them in. They're just like us. Okay. But most of all, we want the government to take care of us. Like we need the government to take care of us. 
So you could say the right have daddy issues and the left have mommy issues, right? It's this idea of get, get a job. Uh, and like, it's interesting because when I was growing up, like my mum had this attitude of like, if, you're, if you don't get a job, you're a bad person. And if anything, that put me off getting a job because I never understood the self-interest of it. This is back to the right wing thing, authority. You should do it because it's your duty. Now, if she'd said to me, as I experienced when I got my first private sector job, the public sector job working for the tax office, which is pretty ironic as a libertarian, was meaningless. Uh, what a waste of time and resources was going on in that building, I can't tell you. But my first private sector job uh, outside working for my dad's factory, working in a news agent, I loved. Um, I had my own money. I learned skills, I learned how to use a cash register, I got better at, say, cleaning a floor, I could speak to people all day and cheer them up. There was a woman that came, I used to say, uh, used to, because I didn't really believe in the products we serving, I decided that my job was to cheer people up. And if someone came on, I tried to make, put a smile on their face. And I remember once um, if people said, oh, it's such a rainy day, which is a cliche in Scotland. I said, well, there's no such thing as a rainy day, just a wet one. Uh, sorry, oh, it's a horrible day. Sorry, it's such a horrible day. I said, there's no such thing as a horrible day, it's just a wet one. And one woman came in one day and said, um, oh, it's a, a wet day today, isn't it? Uh, uh, and, I said, and she said, you know, when you first said that, I thought it was weird, but I said it to my daughter, and now I really like it. I always remember it. And there was another woman that talked to me about, an old lady that talked to me about um, music, because I, I was a classical musician. And she was from Finland and she brought me in a postcard of the Sibelius Monument one day. Uh, I got to meet people, new people, I made friends. So if someone had told me when I was growing up, instead of giving, having an attitude like you're a bad person if you don't get a job, like my mum did, that's your duty, um, to appeal to my self-interest because I was of a left-wing personality structure. Uh, oh, you'll get more money, you'll meet people, you'll have independence, you won't need us, blah, blah, blah. You'll learn skills, you'll feel confident, you'll feel like you're contributing. That might have appealed to me. So this, um, so yeah, the, the left wants someone to take care of them and they have, uh, they, they don't feel competent for life. And I said on our podcast before, the poor don't need the state, the state needs the poor. This is the left-wing misconception. Uh, because that's why they put you to, through 11 to 13 years of mandatory education where they don't teach you any skills that will help you make a living. Coming back to the beginning, you know, um, politics is interpersonal politics. If you were competent, would you really need the government? Would you really be for big government? Um, they, you know, they, they don't teach you any skills that will help you make a living. They keep on adding all these layer, labor laws and occupational licensing to make it harder for the people at the bottom to get on the first rung of the ladder. Because if you get a low paying job, your employer will be able to afford to train you. If the minimum wage is 10, 15 pounds an hour, how is your employer gonna be able to afford to train you and make you more skilled and competent? That's why they don't close the poverty traps, which even progressives oppose, where if you earn more money, you get less, you take less home because your benefits get taken away all at once and you fall off the welfare cliff. Uh, that traps people in poverty. Because I've said this before and I'll say it again, if people at the bottom become prosperous, they'll just do what middle class people do. They take their kids out of the government schools and put them in better private schools. Okay, the government, there's not so many people to say, well, who will educate all those uneducated children because more and more of them are more and more people can afford to send their kids to private schools right and uh, they'll get health insurance so the 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 legitimacy of the nhs is undermined there'll be less crime because there's less poor people so there's less less need for policing the bureaucracy of the police and there's also not an underclass of people who are ready to go into the military because they can't get any other job do you know what i mean as people at the bottom become more prosperous, they start being able to afford the things that the state usually provides. That's why the state needs to over-regulate private provision of education and healthcare and everything to make it so expensive that only elites can afford it. Of course, they want elites to be able to afford it because they need some good schools to send their own kids to. They need some good hospitals for the politicians to go to. So they can't ruin it completely, but they need to regulate it so much that only elites can afford it. Otherwise, people will stop needing the state. And if they stop needing the state, they'll stop wanting the state. This is why statism is an ideology of the dependent. 
Socialism belongs to people who don't feel competent to adult, you know, those memes on um, on social media. I don't feel like adulting today. Oh, it's so funny. It's actually a very fucking serious phenomenon. A lot of people feel underprepared to take on responsibilities of being an adult. And um, so it's not just, you know, people in welfare, students, professors, and well, yeah, like there, there, there is that. It's people, you know, but, you know, professors and public sector workers, public sector workers, they're kind of paid off, but also chances are if, you put them in the free market, they wouldn't be able to earn the wage and benefits that they're earning. They're not competent enough. So socialism begins, belongs to like man children. Um, conservatives, maybe conservatism maybe to people who are forced to go up too fast, on the other hand, you know, people have a much more rigid personality structure. They don't like to have to adapt to change. Um, they they're they're more aggressive, maybe a lot of the time they find there's this mentality of do I find fault with others or do I find fault with myself like it's them it's the enemy overseas it's the immigrants it's the uh, it's the lazy layabouts it's the it's always finding fault with others the left wing is we're always wrong it's western imperialism it's slavery it's injustice for blacks and women you know it's the is it me who are you pointing at the finger at if you're pointing it too much in the way, you're probably on the left. If you're pointing it too much out the way, you're probably on the right. So conservatives, they're scared of foreign invaders. They want to bomb them before they bomb us. They're suspicious of immigrants, but not in a necessarily rational basis, uh, more on an instinctive level. They're critical of people who make irresponsible decisions, like single mothers and things like that. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes I think we're not judgmental enough in our society, but they're not judgmental of people who make irresponsible decisions in a systematic philosophical way. It's more by instinct. They usually believe in smaller forms of things that progressives do. Or we just have too much welfare. Or we just have too much regulation. They don't have a coherent philosophy because they see philosophy as navel gazing, right? Philosophy is for leftists. They, they oh, Oh, philosophy, like they just study at a university. It's just mental masturbation, although they don't like swearing, so they probably wouldn't say mental masturbation. So, which it largely is, you know, actually, to a large degree, it is mental masturbation. It's for people who are not practical, who all they can do is think, right? That's why if you can think and do, you're a fucking superhero. You know, people like Ayn Rand, you know, who had a good work ethic and could think, people like Stefan Molyneux, I mean, how much stuff has that guy done? He's a great thinker and he's also very practical. You're a superhero if you're thinking and practical. And there's a good chance that you'll be a libertarian. Even if you don't know you're a libertarian. There's a lot of people who don't know they're libertarians because they're not, they're too busy to be philosophical and find out. You know, they might not be judgmental of gays or they, they might think you can smoke whatever you want and so forth. But, but uh, so they think they're kind of lefty, but essentially they're for capitalism because they, they work in business. They don't even know they're libertarians. So uh, a Chad, a right winger, is more practical. He's more likely to be able to put up your shelves you, uh, or mow your lawn. The left wingers think too much. They can't do anything. That's why they hate society. They hate the free market because the free market will force them out of thinking into doing practical things. Uh, they only philosophize. They don't do much. They hate being forced to face the consequences of only being able to think and not having practical skills. And um, uh, rightists, you know, they don't see the humanity in criminals. Uh, they, they don't see the reality that people could have had a bad hand or been led astray. They're, they're, like, they're more likely to judge people's character than think, whereas the left wing might have the other extreme, pathological empathy. And, um, you know, the right often favor the death sentence. The left um, want to protect people. So they're both... Uh, from the consequences of their bad decisions. They don't realize that the degree that someone doesn't take responsibility for themselves. If you don't do squats, if you can't get off the toilet when you're old, someone else has to help you off the toilet, right? There's no way around it. If you don't take responsibility for yourself, other people have to take responsibility for you. So as Jordan Peterson says, tidy your room, right? The left don't seem to realize that if that it's a trade-off. If someone doesn't take responsibility for themselves, other people need to make up the slack. 
They think there's just a limitless amount of resources and effort and time to go around. They, they, but usually they don't want to go and take responsibility for the disadvantaged groups. They're not going into uh, areas with disadvantaged children and offering to teach them for free, are they? They want to force other groups, such as the rich, to take responsibility for irresponsible people at gunpoint. They also don't realise that this disincentivizes the habits and skills that make people rich. They don't understand that if you um, force rich people through all these regulations, they won't employ more people. They don't realise that if you tax them too much, they won't take the risk of opening another business because they think, well, if I succeed, I only get to keep 25, 30, 3% of it, but there's a good chance that I'll fail and I'll lose my initial investment. It doesn't even enter their mind that people will stop making uh, constructive decisions if you tax them too much. They actually don't believe that it's good habits that make people rich. They think that it's exploit exploitation and greed uh, when it's actually conscientiousness and high IQ that are the highest predictors of success in Western societies. They also don't realise that when you protect irresponsible people from the consequences of being irresponsible, you're also incentivising irresponsible behaviour. Um, oh, I moved the wrong way. And so, yeah, I, I just said, let's see. Where are we? So... Where are we? Okay. Seems to be going around in a circle here. We're, we're nearly done. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. So, yeah, I guess we could just finish with, well, in that case, if we're talking about the psychology of left and right, I should probably talk about the psychology of libertarians. Do we have our own psychology as well? Where is this uh, infernal drive for consistency and rationality come from? Because most people don't need a coherent political philosophy, but we seem to need one. We hate a lack of coherence. And I have a couple of theories, right? Um, well, first of all, you have to be smarter than the average bear, usually to be a libertarian. I mean, there's a, there's a knee-jerk libertarian, which is just like, mind your own business. But... If you're a philosophical libertarian, as, as most of us are, then there's, um, well, it's intuitive to say, well, I mean, it's, you need to be smart because it's intuitive to say, well, there's rich people over here and there's poor people over there. Why don't we just take from the rich and give it to the poor and that's the problem sorted? Whereas you need to be able to think economically to say, well, that's not going to work because you're going to disincentivize the habits of being rich, whereas you're going to reward the habits of being poor. If people have certain bad habits that are keeping them poor, you're not creating a situation where they're forced to confront those bad habits and change and learn to make their own, stand on their own two feet. Uh, you know, plus you're destroying their psychological health because that help can be taken away at any moment and they won't be able to stand on their own two feet, right? You need to, you know, you know about the scene, seen and the unseen if you're watching this show, you probably have heard of it before. If not, just watch my presentation, Public Versus Private, Why Markets Work. I talk a lot about um, secondary incentives, you know, if you put into a policy into place of policy it doesn't just have the effects that you imagine it will it has secondary and tertiary effects and you need to be quite smart to understand those things but um whatever incentivizes productivity and uh, whatever you can disincentivize productivity but also um incentivize unproductivity which is what basically left-wing programs tend to do so I think there's a couple of other things, but I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm just going from personal experience, so you'll have to feed back for me. A lot of the libertarians I know did not have a close-knit friendship group when they were growing up, right? If you do, then you learn social metaphysics. You learn that you have to have the same opinions as your peer group. Other, and most people have the same, opinion, the same political opinions as the peer group. Right? So you learn not to really care too much if other people have the same political views as you. By the time you get friends, 
by the time you finally do get a close knit peer group, it doesn't matter anymore. The personality structure is formed. It's like, sorry, I'm kind of dedicated to the truth here. Another thing, and you get, this is like we out there, you guys will have to tell me, is I think having a, quite an irrational parent or more than one parent, it might be a prerequisite, or it might not be, but it might be a contributing factor because if your home life is so irrational that you need to develop to highly develop a rational faculty in order to compensate for the irrationality of adults around you, then that that also gets set. And then you need, then you have this need for consistency. You know, if your parents are hypocrites, either you'll learn to uh, the social metaphysics of hypocrisy, or you'll become exceedingly uh, in need of rational consistency and a lack of hypocrisy will become hypersensitive to it, especially if one of them always points out when you're being a hypocrite and being irrational, but never accepts it when you point out their clear hypocrisy and irrationality. Now, does what does that mean for the libertarian new man that we were talking about, Stefan Molyneux's libertarian new man? Well, the peaceful parenting experiment hasn't been tried, and uh, I, I suggest um, following up, you know, buying books like How to Talk So Kids Will Listen, Listen So Kids Will Talk, Parent Effectiveness Training, and what have you. Well, that's it. I'm just going to check out the comments. Thank you to Adam Smasher and Elizabeth Hobson for seeing us live. Um, uh, Citizen Steel 83 and um, Keisha Genius Bits. HIV positive transgender. Oh my God. What's your opinion on white nationalism? My opinion on white nationalism is really um, you should pick people. It's basically the left wing version. The right wing version of poor people should get stuff for free. It's the right wing version of people should like me because I'm the same race as them. No. You have to have the same values as me. You have. Uh, <coughs> I would rather be in a nation that had more people, black people like Walter Williams and um, uh, Thomas Sowell, even though I'm from a Jewish background, if I was white and had my same opinions, I know some well, not some identity will come along and say, the only reason why you're a libertarian is you're a Jew, as though I didn't wake up, uh, as though I didn't have conservative opinions when I was a kid and then moved to a left-wing position and then finally come round to libertarianism. Uh, so I've been in all... Uh, in all national, in all camps. So, um, yeah, if I was white and I had my opinions, I'd rather be in a society with Jews like Ayn Rand, Murray Rothbard, Ludwig von Mises, Milton Friedman, Walter Block, and what have you, and black people like Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams, and white people who are also libertarians, Christians like uh, Tom Woods, and atheists, uh, uh, who had similar values on how they thought uh, reality, uh, a society could be constructed. But put it this way, I'm okay with white nationalists in a libertarian society buying a bit of land and creating their own micro state. I'm cool with that. You know, they can do that. If they only want to be around white people, they've got a right to do that. And same for Black Panthers or whatever. They can have their own money states. I'm, uh, I'm all in favour of their right. And to their their ethno states in a libertarian structure. In fact, I'm for carving a piece of America off and giving it to the giving it to the white nationalists and just go look. Whenever they go, uh, you, you stole the country from the Native Americans. First of all, uh, conquest is not um, is not a legitimate form of acquiring property. But here you go. Here's your state. You can go there, you can make whatever laws you want, it'll be an economic disaster because of your radical protectionism, but go over there and try your, uh, your crazy um, right-wing collectivism out. And if any white nationalists say, uh, why do we have to put up with these blacks? You go, well, look, you've got your own country. You've got your own country. You're free to, you're free to move there, just like the Jews are free to move to Israel. Um, okay. Fear, anger, aggression, these are ways to the dark side. Good afternoon, Roberto Carlos, thank you. Scott Richardson, even though the lefties are more open, their ideologies still all end up in totalitarianism. Could not agree with you more on that point. And it's a worse, it's a scarier type of collectivism, uh, sorry, totalitarianism, because it's based on, we know what's good for you. We are going to force you to comply with what's good for you.
Excellent point. Thank you for pointing it out. And the interesting thing is, people, countries don't recover from communism or socialism as easily as they recover from fascism. Italy, Spain, Chile, they don't seem too badly hampered by their history with, um, with fascism. Uh, so that doesn't mean that I'm a fan of fascism. I hate fascism. I hate collectivism. But, you know, they seem to have recovered better than the communists recovered. Oh, no, 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 trauma, no trauma. Oh, wait, that was damn wrong song. Daily Planet. I don't get it. Sorry, bro. Um, uh, I am the king of the castle and you're the dirty rascal. Uh, what are you going to do with your hair? I'm going to shave it off. Don't forget, everyone, next week, go on YouTube, join the event on Facebook, and please, 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 please uh, invite people on the Facebook event. Finally, welcome to a sort of the small part of the human paradox known as the blame game. Roberta Carlos again. Anthony has style, guys. Shut the fuck up, says Kyle has genius bits. No worries, Anthony. The chat is all about Jedi's in your hair anyway, says Daily Plant. Plant plate. Right. La uh, true deal, Tom. Uh, la my, laughing my ass off. This is liberal as fuck. Obviously, you didn't hear all the bits where I absolutely uh, skewered lefties. I suggest you listen from the beginning. Uh, Bran3 Raven says he is Jewish as fuck. Who gives a shit? Either the things I'm saying are true or they're false. Why does it matter if I'm Jewish or not? Either the things I say are true or they're false. If they're true, then great. If they're false, why don't you use an argument and show me why they're false and debunk them? This is why I hate identitarianism and it is as bad on the right as on the alt-right, at least, as on the left. Um, contrary to what you have been told to believe. So I'm just going to check the comments from Facebook in case they're interesting. If you're still here, well done. If you're not, I don't, I don't mind you having checked out before the end. Sorry, comment people, but we'll just have a quick one. Chelsea Allen, hello, hi. Uh, Joanne Tate says those classes make you look super intellectual. Well, that's because I am super intellectual. Uh, Mark, Michael Arthur Bruza says you can't have division of labour or markets or exchange with, that, with equality. And he also says you can't have individuality and equality. Well, I hate to agree with you, but you're right. Um, no, I don't hate to agree with you. So I guess that's all for me. Until next time, be libertarians. Don't be a lefty or a righty. And I've given you fuck tons of reasons why.